Well, hey, greetings and salutations, everybody, and welcome to this newest installment of Designing Hollywood. Designing Hollywood is dedicated to all things movies and the movie industry professionals who make them. I'm going to be one of your hosts today. Uh, my name is John Campy, and it's been my honor for a while now to have Designing Hollywood be hosted on my YouTube channel, and it's great to have you guys joining us, as it is great for us to have Designing Hollywood on the channel, of course, produced by Martika Ibarra and the great legendary Marilyn Vance. And uh, one of the other hosts who's joining me here today he is a designer he's an artist he's contributed to about 5,000 films including blue beetle you know let me bring this up blue beetle peter pan and wendy day shift jungle crew snake eyes book of boba fett jupiter's legacy godzilla versus kong uh bloodshot maleficent it, it goes on and on and on i'm really excited to be joined by a friend of mine here philip Boutet jr philip how you doing man i'm doing really great and i'm, I'm happy to be here thank you so much john for having me well, and thank you for doing this with me because um, today is a special treat for all of us, particularly me. Uh, it's it's always kind of cool when you get to talk to somebody that you have literally been a fan of for years. And, you know, the guy that we have on with us here today is somebody who's not just an artist or an artist in the fan community, but has literally been uh, a discussion maker in our fan community. I've been calling him for a lot of years an international treasure of the fan community. He's the fan community's own Banksy. He's got over 2 million followers wa watching his and following his art on Instagram. We are so excited to be joined by Coda Abdo, also known as Boss Logic. Coda, hey, how you doing, man? Yeah. I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Thank you for having me on the show. It's like, it's been a long time coming. I've been meaning to talk to you. I don't think we've actually sat down and talked in all these years no so, it's yeah. funny though but for years i know for years we like we would like snap little something on social media saying we've got to talk to each other at some point yeah and i am so thrilled uh that uh that you're joining us here today and uh it's especially great that i've got philip here and i'm able to join philip because uh you know you guys with are such that, with that hit list that you just made it, it talked about phil he was, he was, i'm like i'm reading his list i'm like yeah who's the guest <laughs> and uh i uh, i make youtube videos so i i'm just gonna be sitting here and, and really taking all this in and you know what the first thing i wanted to ask you actually coda is you know and, and there's a lot of stuff we want to cover a lot of ground we want to cover but one of the things that separates you because you know the fan community has a lot of really talented artists who are part of the fan community making art that a lot of people can see and get excited about. But as I alluded to a little bit earlier, what I think makes you distinctive and has made you distinctive for a number of years here is that your art does what the great artists of the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, are. your art gets people talking because you make a piece of art and everybody starts talking and discussing it as as a matter of fact i want to if i can find this oh here this is i want to i want to bring this up here for example i all of a sudden started getting tons of people writing to me after they were talking about you know possibly playing reed richards pedro pascal and it was that's all the conversation was about and then suddenly out of nowhere everybody starts writing to me saying no john he's got to be dr doom he's got to be dr doom and then i realized it was because you created a picture of Peter Pascal as Dr. Doom. Uh, I mean, when did you first realize that your art wasn't just being appreciated by people, but it actually helped spark and steer the pop cultural conversation? And is that something you keep in the back of your head somewhere when you are, you know, composing your newest pieces or whatever? How does that work with you? It's in my head nowadays because apparently like, as you can see, there's influence now, so I, I kind of am wary of what to do in certain things, but sometimes I make it a joke, so it kind of works <laughs> out. <laughs> but um, things like this, like the Pascal one, it's like um, it's I'm creating something that I want to see. Like he, them announcing him as Reed Richards, I can't really see it. It could work, but it's like, but then you got like him playing as a villain because he's got that you know, mean mug that he has. <laughs> I would rather see him as Dr. Doom. That's 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 my take on it. And I, I see, like, with my following, um, they kind of tend to have the same flow as me. So when I create something, it kind of has a ripple effect that, oh, yeah, this is what they want to see or this is what they like. 
And that's why I go with it. So I kind of just produce what I want to see. That makes a lot of sense. Philip? I think it was more for me. I think um, speaking to your point, John, for, for me, Coda is like, I've always said he just has a beautiful mind, his brain and the way he thinks about things and the way he puts them back out. It's just exciting. Right. So it's like, it kind of, it's like he has his finger on the pop culture pulse and it's like whatever kind of the general audience is actually thinking in their head, but might want to see, he's able to express it in his art. Um, but also very quickly. That was the other thing is like, I always laugh because he's ahead of us. So it's like, he's in the future. And by the time I wake up, there's always some new thing <laughs> that I might've even just dreamed about and it's already in existence. Right. So I think that that's the coolest thing. Believe it or not, it's kind of my love for puns that kind of makes me, produce something quickly like if you think of something funny like a, like a pun like when you hear a mm -hmm. word that's kind of like me but with like movie titles or movies in general i find something funny in the word or funny that's happened that correlates with it so and i just go up and produce it sometimes it'll be like 3 a.m i'm like i gotta get up and do this <laughs> well i mean one of the things that that really stands out a lot. It's like I mentioned earlier in the fan community, we are really lucky to have a number of artists out there who, who create some really cool, fun stuff to see. But with you, yeah. it's not just this incredible artistic ability you have. It's your mind. It's the things that you think up and then manifest. Is that something that comes from your fandom of the material? Is that just a natural part of your creative process? Like it, it, you conceptually come up with these amazing images and then you have the talent to bring it to life. How long has that been a part of it? Does it come from your fandom? Where does that come from? It just comes from like, um, that comes from my past way back. Um, so when I think about stuff, like I think I have like the knowledge of music. I do creative writing. I do like, I'm, I'm dabbling in movies. I'm dabbling in games. I kind of bring that all to the basis of like, see, knowledge is light. That's the whole thing. You, you got all this like knowledge and data bank and you keep building on that data bank and you use it like randomly. Mm. I, I, I like to use the word randomly because it's not, it's not every day you do that sort of thing to, to produce like an artwork that would, kind of make someone think differently because that's what i want to do i want to create something different so just my to put my pulse on it uh, other than that i'll be doing i'll be producing stuff that's like just a duplicate of something that's already out there so that that going back to your point where the mind thing is i try to harness that the most because even with like stuff like ai and stuff coming out these days the creative mind and like creative thinking and creative process, that's that's something we have to strengthen because AI eventually is gonna beat us all out. So <laughs> our mind is the thing we have to keep up. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Philip, I've been hogging all the questions, but I'm sure you got <laughs> a couple you wanna ask. I actually just wanted to ask, I think it's more about, I mean, kind of like staying in line with um, with how you're talking about how you kind of create and how you're thinking about puns and stuff like that. Do you ever find, um, trouble i guess in terms of like in your own thought process if you overthink something like where you have an idea and you lose the pun or you lose the idea of the joke if you yes. overthink it yeah uh, sometimes i overcomplicate a design um i usually run it by my close friends like i'll run it by soul i'll run it by amir shady and they will look at it and if they don't get it straight away then i know there's a problem so mm -hmm. i will leave it a day and then just like chop away at it go back a few steps. I I think a, a most of us will remember, and you know, there was a, a TV clip floating around about this too, because there's also a bit of a, for uh, to stretch it a bit here, a bit of a prophetic nature to a lot of your artwork as well. Of course, there's the, the great example of the Rosario Dawson. Years before Rosario Dawson ever got cast as Ahsoka Tano, you created art of Ahsoka Tano and I, I remember I saw an interview clip with Rosario Dawson basically crediting you for, mm -hmm. for getting that. What was that moment for you where you realized the art that you were creating was actually starting to have influence uh, amongst the fan community, amongst all that? Uh, was it the Rosario Dawson? Did it come before that? When was that moment for you that you realized, like, wait a minute, people are really paying attention to what it is I'm doing here? 
Well, there was a few, few cases of it. There was like the Henry Cavill, apparently the Henry Cavill Witcher. There was the Deathstroke. Oh, I remember that one. That was so good. Yeah. So I heard like these things, and it's like they're not they weren't hundred percent confirmed, but there was like reliable sources that 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 my stuff was influenced, and it was in the creative rooms and stuff. But it wasn't until Rosario that was actually officially put out there. And she's like, like even Lucas Films and and Disney, they they ran a whole thing um, pitching how like a a fan is is helping create like connecting those two worlds the fandom and the official stuff and that was a big deal like they sent me over to sydney and we went on the morning show and we talked about it and it was it's a surreal moment it's a surreal moment till now and not only because what had happened and you know the influence side of things it's just where we are in life where social media and our passion and our enjoyment with the community can help us get to a a job or get to a place where we can actually be part of the thing we grew up with, like officially part of it. And we just done that just by posting a picture online. And not only I can do it, everyone can do it just as long as, you know, you're happy and enjoying it. There was also, I was going to say for you, um, I know behind the scenes, as far as a concept artist, like working on these projects, we've been handed his work as well, right? At really? The beginning of something. Oh yeah, so I know for uh, Bloodshot with Vin Diesel, one of the first things that I was handed, they were like, he needs to look as cool as this. And it was, <laughs> it was his artwork, right? So I was like, oh, well, no pressure there, you know, but it was like the the idea of it, he had like kind of a, a stream, like a stream of light coming from his eye, yeah. just his whole thought process and how, he, how cool he made that was awesome. Um, and I think it's also important for you to know that it is something that concept artists have also championed and cheered for, right? Like it's been something mm. that, because we feel seen by him, which is really interesting in terms of like, um, just knowing that like you can, as a concept artist, like do this thing and get a shout out. Like, like, oh yeah, thank you for, thank you for putting me in this role that no one would have saw me as unless you did this, right? Because oftentimes concept artists do that. It's just not credited. It's not something that they see, right? It's not something that goes beyond our little bubble of work. And so I thought that that was just the coolest thing ever is to actually have someone saying, yes, that did happen. And yes, we're going to credit it. And we're going to say it out loud. It just was a nice, it was very much so a nice nod to concept art just in general. It, it makes just, us feel part of like the team. Like, it, correct. You you know, back in the days and even now, it's like the concept artists, like they're doing the dopest shit. Like the, they're the reason like the, the whole movie looks the way it does. And, you know, the cool concept, cool costumes and all that sort of stuff. And it's like they're in the bottom credits at the cinema. And, you know, who else sees it besides us taking the picture at the credits, you know? When was – I was about to ask when was the first time, but maybe I should uh, change the question to have you ever – Coda had uh, like either a director, a studio person, a designer, whatever, come to you and, and say about a movie or a TV show. Oh, you know, that actually totally came from you. <laughs> like we totally had our idea. Like, ha has that ever happened for you? Um, Not officially. Because you know, it has happened. I'm just wondering if anybody's had the guts to acknowledge it. No, nah, because here's the thing. It's not, it, and it's totally understandable, but. If you're a producer or the person that created like the storyboard or anything about a successful show, you don't want to give the credit away. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> but yes, <laughs> it does have it does happen, I think, more often than not. Um, and I think it's one of those things too. The studio is not done. The studio will look at stuff, they're out there sourcing, they're out there looking for what the what fans want, what people want, because ultimately their their goal is to make money and to connect with the fans, right? They want to get people to the yeah. theater. So it behooves them to be smart enough to at least follow trends or follow what people are into so that they have a better shot at being successful. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's what you're able to do with your artwork is you've been able to find like I'm like almost like you're speaking, you're a voice of the fans at this point like look this is what we want to see make that happen and if they listen it's usually successful <laughs> is i want like as to your point i want studios to normalize like um appreciating like the people that make the movie like mm. not that not only the actors not only like the people that are just circling you know the cameras and stuff but you know the artists and stuff and, and it, it kind of it's kind of always an echo when we say this, but it's 
it's really time to actually shine the light on, even if like there's an award or something, just like for the team. It's like it just needs to happen because I know the process. Like it's been five years or t uh, almost six, seven years now. I'm in concept art, and so I know what can't, what Phil goes through. And basically, the concept artists all the way to the finished artists, like they create the whole movie. Like they're the blueprint. It's like when is the blueprint not worth mentioning? You know. I I wanted to to also ask. You know, clearly your place in the fan circles around the world is is, is firmly established. But I I want to know your art. Does it come from the fact that I mean, clearly you are a fan in and of yourself. You are a fan of of the the cultural stuff that we have. Is that where your desire and inspiration for art came from did it come from somewhere else what were some of the specific things that influenced you and got you on the path that you're on right now i've always been i've always been a artist like not a good one at the start but it's like i've always been an actual artist in a sense from like grade four or five it's like i stopped like concentrating in school i stopped concentrating like on the <laughs> proper stuff like i was drawing Books. I was like dabbling with, you know, drawing like Dragon Ball Z, wrestling, all that sort of stuff. And I kept creating crossovers and mashups then. And it's like it just kept basically evolving. And my friend later in the later years introduced me to digital art. And that's when I went from, I wasn't really creating art, I was creating like posters for nightclubs and all that sort of stuff. And that kind of, there was no real passion there. It was just like, oh, cool, I can do digital art and make a bit of money here and there. But it wasn't until later on, maybe 2013, 2014, they, like, that's when my fandom stuff started pushing in. I started watching more TV shows. I started watching, like, you know, the Arrowverse and all that sort of stuff. And it just, like, I wanted to join the conversation with the community. And it's like, how would I join the conversation and actually, you know, spark cool things, you know, cool, cool topics? So I started creating posters weekly for certain episodes and it kind of blew up from then. And it's like, and you kind of get that, um, I don't know if Phil gets it, but you get kind of get that serotonin is like when everyone's like happy and all that sort of stuff and you're, and you're contributing and they're enjoying it, you're enjoying it and they want to see more. And it's like, it just went from there. It's like, I just felt like I was doing a service for the people that enjoy what I enjoy. And I was enjoying it at the same time. So, yeah. There's those moments when you're creating artwork too, where you, like you said, you you get, there's a moment where you're like, I don't know if this is going to work. And then there's a moment where you're like, this is really going to work. And then you get excited about it because you just can't wait to, for other people to be like, that's what, that's exciting. That's what I want to yeah. do, right? Yeah. I think that that's a cool thing. I think you do that more often than not, where just something yeah. will come out or just the way you play with stuff, I think is interesting. Yeah. Um, well, there's sometimes that... you put something out there and it's like, oh my God, this is going to kill it. And it's like, that's nothing. I'm like, yeah, that's not the video. <laughs> People are like, no, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to throw this out there too, because at, at times when following your, your work, there'll be clearly something that's on your imagination and because you'll put out like several pieces. And as somebody who is like my most anticipated movie coming up right now is Deadpool three. And, and I've noticed through the years, you've done a lot like of Deadpool work and Deadpool art. What is, and you got a couple of really great ones like out there right now that are just hilarious as well. What is it about, you know, the, the Deadpool property that, that kind of gets your imagination going? Cause you've made a lot of really cool Deadpool stuff. I love, like, I respect Ryan Reynolds a lot, like a whole heap. And, you know, when you respect the person and you respect the title and you respect the character and you like everything about it, it's kind of, the creative ideas come easy. So I just, and it's one of my favorite like IPs on in the cinemas like right now. It's like it hasn't failed for me. So, and it's always funny to do, you know, obnoxious or stuff that's like crosses the line with Deadpool because you can. So it's it's easy to do. He kind of fits your sense of humor too. And I think between Ryan, Ryan was born to play that character because everything, even up before that point, his natural sense of wit was like, 
that should have been a no brainer for everyone. The fact that he had to do the whole yeah. thing and make that whole thing just to get that. It's like, yeah. you guys, like, literally, this is, this is a no brainer. You should do this. And so I'm happy to see it, but I'm also happy to see you play within that world so much because it's all tongue in cheek and you kind of do that really well as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 you got to enjoy, like, that's why when I get sort of certain gigs um, that I'm not really into, it's like my creative juices are like not there. So I have to like, mm -hmm. I literally have to watch the movie, read the book or read people's reviews on it so I can find the details that I can pull out of it. So that's, that's the hard part. See, with Deadpool, I don't need any of that. I just need to like hear him say something or, you know, give me one word. And that's, that's basically, I can do something out of that. I wanted to ask you, you know, I think it was George Clooney. I might be wrong about this, but I thought it was George Clooney who kind of coined the saying that, you know, I do one for them, like for the studios and the audience, and I do one for me and uh, making one of his artistic films. I'm wondering with you, with, with the art that you create, because like so obviously so much care, detail, time goes into each piece that you make. Where does it come from most? Does it come from like you are like you are personally like really into this one thing right now and so you want to create something around it does it come from you know you hear the the fan community talking a lot about it and you think well the fan community would like to see me create something like this like where more often than not does your initial motivation for a piece come from or is it kind of like george clooney where you do one for yourself and one for the fans like how does that work with you well it's a bit of everything um well it depends on what the title is. If it's a new title that no one knows about, you need to think of the focal point of the movie and like create something that will expose it so well so people can watch it. Because if they don't know anything about it, that they're kind of like not going to really go into it. Um, when it's a film that's nostalgic, you usually play on an, uh, something that the fans already know. Like if you've seen an old Star Wars poster, you kind of mimic that, but in your own way, that way they can correlate, like the, their vision is like set with it. So they know what they're looking at and they know what it is. And then there's the George Clooney thing you're saying. I do that all the time. Like studio will give me a direction and I'll make my own one and I send both. And they're like, your one's amazing, but we're going to go with this one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when you're looking at, you know, the movies that are coming out and, and stuff like that, and I, I wanted to, to play a little game with you here uh, for a second, if if you will. I wanted to get, and since we have Philip here himself, although Philip, you it almost doesn't count because you've actually worked on one or two of these things. <laughs> what I wanted to do, Coda, was like as somebody who who's drawing these things, who is illustrating and bringing a lot of these things to life, I wanted to throw, and a lot of the stuff that you do centers around the superhero community and stuff like that. I wanted to take a minute and uh, look at a couple of modern, currently on the screen superheroes and kind of get your take on how these, uh, what you like about the designs, what maybe you would do with the designs if you had a chance. So let's start off with this one. Let's start off with the uh, new Black Panther. Of course, Sh Shuri became Black Panther in the new Black Panther. Her costume looked a little bit different and a little bit uh, unique from T'Challa's one. Uh, what did you think about the costume of the new Black Panther? And what did you like about it? Maybe what would you have done with it if uh, you were going to add your flair to it? I actually wouldn't have changed that one. That one was actually pretty good. Um what I would have put, like, just as an introduction, if you've seen in the comics where she has the the fur, the white fur, right? I would have like had that as an intro, but when she's fighting, take it off. But it's like as aesthetic, I would have had that just as a look because it would have made awesome like posters and awesome like even merch or statues as well. So that's what I think. But the actual costume for fight aesthetics and everything was a dope costume. All right, let's try another one. I want to go with. Uh... I want to try Flash. Now, of course, the the, the DC versions of Flash, they had the, the the body armor kind. They adapted that a bit in the new one. What did you like about what DC did with Flash's outfit there? And uh, what would you have done with it? I have the same complaint as everyone else. Why did they need armor on Flash? It's like everyone has that complaint. <laughs> it's like, what? you don't need it. And the thing is, I don't know why his head looks so big. Like I would have put like the chin, like the chin strap just so his head can be not, look not as big but his head's massive 
So. <laughs> All right, and I just kind of spoiled the next one I wanted to bring up. It's it's actually one of my favorite uh, movies of the past five years or so. I, I love Shang-Chi. Uh, you had a chance to see uh, the design of the costume and everything on Shang-Chi. Shang -Chi, I think some of it was supposed to be dragon scale inspired, whatever. What did you think about it, and what would you have done a little bit differently with them? I like the costume. It's amazing. They kept to the tradition. I just don't like short sleeves on superheroes. I don't. Ah. It never made sense to me. I think if it was long sleeve that kind of transitioned into the rings, that would have been dope. But yeah, I don't like shorts. I just don't like short sleeves. Yeah. All right. Let me try one, one more for you here. Of course, anybody who's watched my stuff any period of time, Henry Cavill's my boy. And, and so of course we got, we got Superman. Now, this is really interesting because I remember back when, when Superman returns was coming out, the director was at Comic-Con and one of the audience members asked the director, why did you change the costume of Superman? To which the director responded, what do you mean? There have been 27 iterations of the Superman costume in the comics. So when you say, what did you, why did you change it? Change it from what? Obviously Henry Cavill had his own look here uh, with Superman. We've clearly got, a new Superman coming. James Gunn has a new Superman coming. What would you do with the Superman costume in James Gunn's universe? What would carry over from Henry's or others that you would take? What What would you do? I think, I think what's going to carry over is he's going to go with brighter colors. He's going to go with bright blues, bright reds. And I think he might go back to the brighter yellow and red emblem. I think he'll go with them. I don't know if they'll do the underwear on top of the thing. I think that's gone. That's what I want to ask both of you guys, actually. Like, if, like if, if, if either of you are put James Gunn calls either of you and says, okay, give me a Superman concept. I, I, let me start with you, Philip. Pro underwear or no underwear? I'm probably pro no underwear because I went through underwear gate the first time on Man <laughs> of Steel. Um, I was there for that. And I think it's it's a difficult design to make work with the new aesthetics of suits. But I'm I'm also very much so pro trying it because we did find options to where it looks cool. You won't get it. If you put the suit. But it doesn't the, make sense. Yes. Well, well that, that, that's the thing, right? And then if you try to kind of put it on the suit in a way like the suits are made now, it just, it breaks up the suit. It looks like Superman, but it just kind of doesn't make sense. So every time yeah. you put them on, everyone's like, that's a little weird. Or they're like, okay, that looks cool, but why? And then the oh, question is like, I don't know why. You know, like, Does he have underwear under the suit as well? Like, is the underwear suit underwear? What's that's happening? a very good um, question. That's what America wants yeah. to know. <laughs> that's the one usually it's just a, like a, a skin tight like almost like a skin tight bodysuit like it's a it's a bodysuit it's a muscle suit that has painted reflections in it so when you look through the suit you can still see the definition of the armor and stuff like that but they have to be able to go to the bathroom so it's like there's two suits under there you know so sometimes in some suit, yeah. is he always wearing a suit under his, under his clothes is he always wearing the suit no so not all the time I mean, like, like I mean, that that's they they want you they want you to believe that, but no, I mean, I just don't know where the cake. Maybe maybe yeah yeah maybe, maybe yeah. Though who knows where the cake was? Maybe he's just fast enough to always change and go get it. I don't know. <laughs> now, uh, before we continue here, guys, uh, we want to take a quick second and uh, thank a sponsor of today's uh, episode of Designing Hollywood, and it is the Who's the Boss podcast it is the podcast of boss logic where boss logic and his friends talk about absolutely nothing and possibly everything go and find who's the boss cast on your favorite podcasting app of choice clearly it's right there on apple Podcasts. go and find it subscribe to it and uh check out boss logic's podcast uh so congrats on that as a matter of fact uh you know coda uh, tell us about the the podcast you know, I'm, I'm reminded i'm reminded a little bit there was a very global famous video clip that was going around where on, uh, I think it's Britain's Got Talent, the girl who actually sings Never Enough from The Greatest Showman. But most people in the world didn't know it was the actress in the movie. It was her. And she came out on America's Got, or Britain's Got Talent and sang the song. And she said, I want to finally put a face to it. 
what was behind you wanting to create a podcast? Because you've just been this, you've been our Banksy. You've been the fan community's Banksy. You've been this like for a long time, this faceless person that nobody knew. What made you want to come out and do something like a podcast? And how have you been enjoying it so far? Well, to rewind before the podcast, um, I had to put my face out there because when I wanted to go to basically Hollywood and, you know, talk to these producers, especially the Russo brothers, it's like I was going to LA and it's like, holy shit, that they, they I know what I look like. It's like, I'm, I might need to show myself just so I'm not some random guy coming to their studio. Um, so I made a whole post, showed myself online, talked to people, and it kind of started a wave where everyone's like, there was a lot of people that don't show their faces and stuff because I had social anxiety and all that whatnot. And that's why I didn't show myself. I just showed myself through art. Um, but this whole thing inspired people to want to do the same and a whole bunch of people actually start posting you know videos of themselves and all that sort of stuff so i'm glad i kind of helped there um it's a good feeling because it made me feel better um but the podcast is something it, it was it, like with phil phil we have conversations and we have random conversations and they're like the best conversations it's like that's what we do and it's like Let's start a podcast of just random yeah. shit. And it's like, that's what we do. And like guests come over and we talk to them about their stuff and they talk to us about our stuff. And it's just like, that's all these days are. It's conversations and getting to know people and all that sort of stuff. But it's hard to conversate like abroad now. So we did a podcast to bring everyone in. And when, when we watch a movie or we have something to talk about, like a TV series or something, I just get my friends and we sit down, talk random stuff, you know. And on the podcast, you can just like spitball ideas and that kind of don't like that have to be serious. And people can just enjoy the the rantings and the babbling on. And yeah, we found it fun. And we we took a break for a bit because of some issues, um, but we'll be back in January, so early January. All right. Well, listen, as a designer who knows more about the inside of this world, I'm sure Philip's got some more interesting questions for you than I do. So <laughs> Philip, why don't you take it away? I, I wanted to know, I think in terms of just like a uh, process, like when you're, when you are kind of sitting down to design and you're kind of thinking about how to show things, I've noticed you switch styles a lot, like in terms of like you switch styles to get the job done. Can you talk about that process a little bit in terms of like when you try to like, if it, how you evoke a style, basically? Yeah, so basically it's aesthetic. It's if, if, the, if the title fits it, I, I go with that title, with that style. Something that would like cater to what's what I'm producing. Like there's some styles that will like if you put neons and all that sort of stuff it kind of like sparks it like if you do a like that venom <laughs> i did a piece where it was just stylized in black and yellow and a lot of people didn't like that aesthetic because it didn't fit that aesthetic but it still was a dope poster but it doesn't fit the aesthetic of what they were usually want to see so i switched up the style to pink and pink and purple um and sort of a grungy style and everyone just it's the same image but everyone loved that so much like the other one didn't exist so it's just a color palette and a subtle style change to fit the aesthetic of what the, the viewer is seeing and that's what i usually tend to look and focus on before i start the piece yeah now you have you also have your kind of like fan favorites of the things and the, the you know people that you're following and admiring and all that. My question would be: Is there a specific project, uh, any project like in the fandom of of, of anywhere that of, of things that you've seen from when you were a kid up until now that you would love to work on? Like if they said we're doing this right now, what's the project that you would want to want to do? Anything from the nineties, like the, the things that I've been putting out, like the stuff that flies, yeah. like. Street Sharks and you got like uh -huh. uh, Google. all that stuff is coming out, coming out. Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But it's like, how do I get on it? And I'm pretty sure the concept yeah. artists have I've already drawn this for the like the last two years. And stuff. <laughs> like, on the promotional side, like uh, posters, banners and all that sort of stuff, I would love to get part of it. Obviously, I, I want to be part of the behind the scenes stuff because then you kind of like full circle moment. It's like you've done stuff, mm -hmm. the stuff you grew up with, you're working on it. That's, that's, that's always the goal as an artist, as an artist. I kept industry. thinking about them and I thought about gargoyles, like gargoyles, definitely. Um, but then there was one that was like, 
Right. No, I was like, as soon as I saw the announcement, it was the same thing. It's like, how do we get on this? Like, how do I work on this? This would be yeah. incredible. But then it it called back a nostalgic moment for me. Do you guys remember Dark Water? Or the, was it the Pirates of Dark Water? Is that, I think that was called. Do you remember that cartoon? Well, I, I, okay, I, don't, I remember Dark Water, the Jennifer uh, uh, Paul Bettany's movie. I remember that movie. I don't no, remember that animated oh, movie. Oh, I remember that. No, so there was an animated show. I think it was. Yeah, it was a horror movie. That's exactly what it was. That one. I remember that. So, no, it was called, like, The Pirates of Dark Water. It's around the same kind of time. Like, it's during the 90s, and it was, like, this whole thing, and it was just this cool project. And I just, I think it it kind of reminds me. It has the same nostalgic feel for me for, like, Thundercats or Silverhawks and all of that stuff. Um, but it's really, it's kind of off the beaten path. But it's just one of those ones like Gargoyles or anything else where I think for me, that's a project where I'd be like, yeah, I could really get in there and kind of show something. What, what's that, what's that shit called? The cartoon? Centurions? Is that what it was called? They were like, is that what it was called? Is that they, where they kind of look like the silver hawks a little bit? They kind of like they look like jets or something. They look like robots, sort of thing. Oh, oh um, I don't remember that. Don't remember. And they had like a villain know. that looks really bad with two heads. <laughs> it sounds great to me. Sold it. Now we have to look all of these up because I don't remember. Like, but it's like that's what I love the nostalgia. Um, I, 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 need, I wanted to ask you, and I know this is an awkward one because it kind of puts you on the spot a little bit, but uh, if you can, um, you know, we've mentioned that our fan community has a lot of great people doing great fan art. I mean, that, that looks really good and looks really wonderful. I wanted to ask you, what do you believe when you think about it? And again, I, I hate putting you on the spot here, but what makes your art what makes your pieces something that has really connected with the community? Because listen, when you ask nine out of 10 people in the community, when you think of art, what do you think of? They're going to say boss logic, right? What do you think it is about your work that has ingrained itself so well? Why has it succeeded on like another level than like any other artists in our circles before have been able to do? Why do you think that's worked so well? It's, it's a really hard question to answer because I just produce for the sake of producing the stuff I like. But Phil mentioned to me it's more my ideas and the, my process time. So if I create something, it's usually hours or probably days before anyone else. And it's like that I connect the idea with the execution. And I think that's what kind of sets me apart. But I don't like to be put in a position where I'm I'm set apart because I think everyone's doing their part so, and it strengths like it strengthens everything. It's just I think people because of the speed of social networks, it's you know, you got your stuff out there first or you got your stuff out there before anyone else. It that's why it correlates with everyone, like, oh, it's boss logic. Oh, that's who made it. It's because it's the news, it's the breaking news. It's I'm the one that produced it for them first. I think that's what the question is. Yeah. To that point, I, I have an artist, another friend of mine who's an artist, and we were talking about you once a couple of years ago, and they said, you know, that mother blah, blah, blah. He said, I, I, it would take me, he said, it would take me about three days to put that one together. And I feel like 10 minutes after some piece of news comes out, Boss Logic's got like this incredibly detailed, intricate, beautiful piece out there. Like you seem, we don't see you work, but you seem to work on an incredibly fast pace. Like you seem to have ability to, to conceptualize and create this art really fast. Is that, is that normally been a part of your. I think it's, I think it's like smoke and mirrors. You guys are asleep while I'm in the AM <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be like 3 AM or 2 AM and I'm working till like 5 AM and I'll put it out there and I'll go to sleep. You guys wake up and it's like, this guy created it while we wake up. It's like, that's it's like, it was like, <laughs> Just then and there. It's like, no, nah, it's a couple hours, but it's like you guys were sleeping at the time. Um, actually, a question for both of you guys here. What are, mm -hmm. what would you say are, because, you know, different eras bring different styles. Sometimes eras bring different color palettes that seem to go across the whole thing. When you look at the, particularly the genre uh, movie landscape right now, what are some of the 
trends you see in design right now that's being applied in our movies, whether it's costuming or overall character concepts? What are some of the trends that you guys see and what are some of the ones that you guys like and maybe some of the ones that you guys don't like so much? Mm. That's a good question. Design or just overall like Overall, whether it's costume, character design, uh, just concept art in general, what are some of the things that kind of stand out now that maybe weren't a primary thing, you know, in, in the early 2000s or something like that? I like, besides a few movies, I don't see a lot of people taking, they're taking risks, but the, the risks they're taking is that a lot of stuff looked the same. Like if you mm. look at different movies, you kind of, you look at Marvel's aesthetic in their costumes and you look at the other movies that are not even connected to Marvel, they're kind of, you kind of, you would think the same designers made them. It's like, but a lot of movies, but that's not even the designers or the creative process's fault. It's just the direction of the movie. They want, like Phil would say, even like studios will give, or hand you a, a picture of another movie. It's like, we want this. <laughs> right. Like, yeah. I like I for yeah. instance I want to bring this one up again like one of the one of the stylistic thing trends I see today uh neither good nor bad I'm just saying it's one of the things like when you look at Henry Cavill Superman a lot of superhero costumes I find today have that I, for lack of a better term what am I what a texture that texture where it's kind of like the it's like a thousand indentations along with it. I, 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 am I, is that the right word I'm using? Texture? But I, I find a lot of superhero costumes these days have that same kind of pattern texture because that's not just a flat piece of fabric on there. That's that's a very textured piece, and I, I've noticed that a lot. Have you guys seen that as well? Is that something you like in these designs? Uh, I like it uh, in the sense of it's highly detailed, like the designer or the costume artist you know created something that's like if you zoom in it's it's crazy detail but the thing is the only thing i dislike about it is that you need to do close-up shots in the movie just to appreciate <laughs> what about you I'd say, I'd say um you actually you nailed it um i think that this is what i was going to talk about the most at least in terms of trends um I'll, I'll give a call out or a shout out to costume designer liz wolf who did jupiter's legacy um i remember working with her and i felt like she really tried to push outside of what we normally do to make something different um right so those costumes even down to the undersuit um the undersuit uh the body the we normally do a muscle suit right so paint by numbers costume design at least in terms of like superhero suits is there's some kind of muscle suit there's a stretch fabric that goes over that muscle suit that then has some kind of printed texture on it right so whereas i'm fine with that because i think it actually ends up looking good i think what i'm not fine with is when you overdo it or if the texture is too big because there's no visual rest so i think for me i try to get like that balance where there's a texture in there but the character looks like themselves that's the first thing too is changing the character so much i hate when people change the character so much that you can't tell who it is anymore or it doesn't look like what you wanted to see it should be an elevated version of what you would imagine in your head, but couldn't even imagine it until you see it, right? So like, I remember I give the example, Jupiter's Legacy, I felt like she tried something different. Uh, Maya's Rubio for Blue Beetle, she tried something different, at least in terms of like the breakups of that suit, um, which was super interesting. Um, but I remember just like, if you could go from, we all loved, or when we were all watching Power Rangers, right? We're all young and they've got these like spandex suits on that are super unforgiving. They don't do anything for the person underneath. It's just a spandex suit and a helmet and some gloves and boots, right? Then we got to that first movie right with the first original power rangers and they had this elevated kind of bumped up almost like motorcycle armor or whatever it was that was cool it looked like them but it was elevated enough to where i was like okay that's really cool right so i think that design wise you know i try to make sure that i'm in the pocket of elevating something while still paying fan service to knowing that there's a whole fandom of people out there that specifically by the time this movie gets to us, the people that are working on it or making it, there's a whole group of people that made it get to us, right? Like it's that popular. So you owe them back to be able to say, I'm gonna give you something back now to like, like pay it forward, right? So I'd say that that was probably it. The trend of the superhero suit, I think can be pushed now a little bit more. So I'm, I'm curious to see, we have all these new patterns or we have all these new, like we have 3D printing now, we have uh, digital, digital knitting, there's all kinds of things. So now I'd like to see design like 
take that trend and then maybe do something else or try something else, right? Because it does get a little sometimes paint by numbers where everyone's like, we need to add a texture to the suit. And sometimes I'm like, why? You know, I'll question it. I'll say, why? Does it need it? Or like, can it be in small areas? Does it have to be that big? Those are the questions I ask. Well, guys, we're, we're just about out of time here. And, and so I wanted to th throw a question to you, Coda, that I'm sure you get asked all the time. So I'd be remiss if I didn't bring it up here because it's probably on the minds of a lot of people. You know, you are in our community, certainly by a mile, you're kind of the, uh, you're the gold standard. You're the one that's kind of the inspiration for a lot of other people. For young artists who look at you and would say to you, and again, I'm sure you get this question all the time, you know, what advice would you give to uh, the kids that are out there that love art, that are getting involved, that want to be able to do what it is you guys do? What, what's the top one or two pieces of advice you would give to that kid? The top advice I say all the time, as you said, um, is like you have to enjoy and love what you're doing first. Oh, so good. Before, yeah. Before anything else. So before the numbers, if you're going to do it for numbers, you're going to do it for social reach, you're going to do it for popularity as soon as those three things fade you're going to stop and hate what you produce and that's not the goal like literally create what you love put it out there be consistent keep out doing yourself be your own rival and then you'll eventually get the right eyes seeing you social media is a big place like and everyone's fishing so yeah well, Coda, listen, this has been uh, beyond a pleasure for me and a thrill. I mean, you and I have been going back and forth for a while saying we need to do something like this. And I'm so glad we were able to do it today. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. Just want to remind everybody, uh, go and become one of the 2.2 million people that uh, follow Coda's Boss Logic's art over there on Instagram. You can find him simply at Boss Logic. And again, just go there and just visit this, his page every day because there's like so much stuff that will just spark your imagination, make you feel joy. Uh, go and check that out. And of course, to uh, my co-host here today, Philip, thanks so much for uh, for doing this with me and letting me do this with you. Appreciate that very much. You guys are gods in this space. I admire what both of you guys do so much. And so thank you guys for joining us so much. That'll do it for this installment of Designing Hollywood. My name is John Campia. And until next time, everybody, bye-bye.